So this week, um, uh, we are in Matthew 13 again. Next week, this is your uh, PSA, public service announcement. Are you ready? What's next Sunday? Okay, some of y'all weren't sure. Like, wait, what? Father's Day is next Sunday. Listen, just so you know, Father's Day is like on the list of holiday rankings. It's almost at the very bottom. And I hate that, okay? I don't mind that Mother's Day is up high. I just want Father's Day to be up right. It could be one below Mother's Day for all I care. But listen, um, just so you know, most of the time on Father's Day, here's the, some variation of this message from a platform like this, from a stage like this, behind a pulpit like this, is preached. Some message like this. Hey, dads, shape up. That's normally the theme of the Father's Day message. Some version of, come on, guys, step up and lead your family. What's wrong with you people? That's, that's most of the time the message that everybody gets on Father's Day. Um, this year, um, here's, here's the, the title of next week's sermon. Are you ready? What a dad slash husband needs. So dads, next week, don't flake on Father's Day. We're going to help you out, <laughs> okay? And most of you have wives, have, have children that are, you have a wife. Uh, but the group, the wives, right? That's a different Father's Day message. Um, but most of you, your, your wife, she's wonderful. She loves you well. She takes care of you. I'm helping you right now. All of y'all just like, right, oh, we're talking about you, right? So um, your children, they love you well. They take care of you, all those different things. But, but I want to call out uh, from the Word of God what I see some very basic and foundational things that men who are husbands and dads especially what we need okay so i want i want you dads you know how everybody shows up well it's mother's day let's go to mom's church get them here and we'll talk to them about how they should be loving you and treating you (laughs) all right all right get them in here it's gonna be a great week gonna be a great week okay today uh kind of a weird composite of scripture if you remember a month or so back we stopped a sermon because of what time it was. And you're thinking, yeah, we're going to have to do this again this week, Pastor, if you don't get going. We stopped a sermon because of what time it was. Um, and also, it was a great break because we knew coming this week, the themes were going to match up. So we're going to go back to that text. That's why you saw verses 40 through 43 read with 47 through 52, because thematically they match up. All right? So um, if you're not in Matthew 13, get there real quick. And here we go. Sometimes... People in authority don't respond how we think they will. Have you ever had an experience like that? Now, that can go in either direction, right? You think maybe something's not going to be that big of a deal, and your dad or your boss or whoever, they disagree with you. They think it's a very big deal and respond accordingly. Other times, you think, oh, this is going to be bad, this is not going to be good, and then you share... And that person in authority kind of, they respond like, well, nah, okay. I had an experience like this the first semester of my senior year of high school. How many of you in high school experienced some level of senioritis your last year of school, last year of high school, right? Some of you did that in college as well. The difference is somebody was paying for that, right? Unless you were at a private Christian school or a private school of some kind in high school, right? Well, I started experiencing some senioritis. It was during football season. I had my focus on where I thought it really needed to be. And um, I was a good student. I made good grades. I was um, in high school. I was president of the National Honor Society. I was on beta, like all these things. So I made good grades. So it surprised my, one of my teachers, and I don't even remember what class this was, but it surprised one of my teachers when I made a C on a test. I didn't make Cs. That literally never happened, Right? My dad's perspective with my sister and I, uh, with us, he said, listen, I want you to do the best you can do. And if you do the best you can do, if you get a C, if you get whatever, as, as long as you can say that was the best I could do, I'm okay with that, okay? Um, but if it's not the best you can do, and you get a grade lower because maybe you were lazy, maybe because you weren't paying attention, whatever, then we have issues. It's less about what the grade is and more about did you meet your, your, your expectations and based upon, like, your ability? So I, my, I got a C on a test, and my teacher, there were people in the class, lots of people in the class who made lower grades than me on this test. I, I do remember that. 
Um, but I, out of everyone in the class, my teacher walks to my desk. She didn't embarrass me, but she walks to my desk, and she had a stamp. And this was one of those stamps, like you don't want this stamp on your paper, because this was a stamp that said something along the lines, and there was, it, it stamped a line, and it had some words, and it said something to the effect of parent signature. She sent me home. She sent me home with this C test that was below what she thought my capacity was, my, what my ability was, that I believed was lower than my ability, but I was willing to just, senioritis, let's move on, right? But she thought my dad might want to know about this. This was a good teacher. Amen? It was a good teacher, okay? So I'm scared, y'all. I'm scared, like I'm nervous. But one thing I did know, and one thing that I had learned very well, was that my dad was very well connected with everyone in this community, okay? Literally, where I grew up, um, just outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, in a little town called Harrison, Tennessee, I literally would come home from high school, and sorry, Julie, and talk about like, hey, there's this girl, and my dad would say something like, well, what's her last name? <laughs> now, okay, what's, what's her daddy's name? yeah, you can't date her, that's your cousin, right? Like, okay, like that happened more than once, okay? That conversation happened more than once. Well, this conversation, I'm coming home, and I know that my dad, like some of my teachers, they were his teachers, okay? They had been at the same high school long enough. Some of them that were my teachers were his teachers. Some of the other people that were my teachers, he went to school with at this place or knew their family or something, so very well connected, my dad was really strict, and listen, I literally didn't get away with anything growing up. Now, I still tried to get away with stuff, and I tried to be sneaky, I tried, but he, he literally caught me every time I ever did anything. It might not have been right then, but within a week or so, I was caught, right? Be sure your sins will find you out, okay? My dad helps me with that. So, because I knew that, because I had learned at this point, I'm 17 years old, I have learned at this point, I don't know Jesus yet, so, but I had learned at this point that he's going to find out I should just probably face this head on. So the day I got the test to take home, I walked in after football practice, my dad's there, I walk into the living room and I'm like, hey dad, I need to give you something, I need, need you to sign this. And So I hand it to him and my dad, he's in his recliner, he's watching TV, he holds it up, kind of looks at it, and just doesn't, I have, I have a pen, I brought him a pen to sign it with, because I want to make this as quick as possible, I don't want this to drag out because he can't find a pen, so he, he's looking at it, he just does this with his hand, stick a pen in it, he grabs it, hands it to me, and like never breaks eye contact, never makes eye contact with me, it breaks eye contact with the TV to the paper, back to the TV, and he's back. Now this was not normal. And to be honest with you, this scared me more than if he had lost it, <laughs> right? And so from a, this bewildered state, I, I'm holding this paper in my hand, and like he's like moved on. And I, I, I wanted, I, at this point, I think in my broken estate, I wanted him to be mad. Like that's it, I literally said, that's it? <laughs> he hands me the paper back, I get the pen. I'm like, that's it? And this is what he said. It's one of these like Yoda moments, right? Like Mr. Miyagi, like he got me. He said, your grades won't affect my paycheck. <laughs> Dad! Like, <laughs> I, because immediately I got it. He was making the point, my, it's not gonna, it doesn't make a difference to him, but it could make a difference to me. So I should really think about this before I bring home another C, right? So, Sometimes those in authority, they don't respond how you think they should or how you think they might. Jesus shows up here in, in what we see in Matthew 13, and we have all these parables, and all these parables are about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And he's laying out all these pieces, all these information. The parables build upon one another, build upon how you enter into the kingdom, how you live in the kingdom, how you respond as a kingdom citizen. All these different things, all these different pieces, and they build upon one another. But the Jews thought that if Jesus was truly the Messiah, he would have done things differently. 
he starts telling these parables. He starts explaining them to his, his closest disciples, the 12, but he didn't explain them to the others. And essentially, the content of this is, I'm setting up my kingdom, but it's not going to be the way you think it is. Because what the Jews wanted, what the Jews expected, was Messiah to come and set everything up right then, right now, deal with all these sinners, deal with all these pagans, deal with all these Gentiles, and just wipe them out, and you come here and we're going to just take over everything. That's what they anticipated and Jesus did not respond that way. So let's get into this because I'll tell you, last week, as, as sweet and as wonderful as the, the parables were that we looked at last week, this week has some hard stuff in it. Has some hard stuff in it. But I'm going to tell you, the hard stuff that is in this week, when we look back at the pearl of great price, as we look back at the treasure hidden in the field, it makes those even sweeter. Okay? But we got to deal with this truth. So here we go. Are you ready? Matthew 13, we'll start, um, we're going we're gonna to focus on verses 47 through 52, but we're going to reference back to 40 through 43 because it says almost the same thing in 40 through 43 as it does in part of our parable today. So, so we're going to hang in 47 through 52, but we'll go back in a minute. All right, let's start. Four points. Here's point number one. Ready? We get a parable of the net. Number one, the trope of the net. The trope of the net. Trope is essentially language used in a figurative or non-literal sense. The net is not a literal physical net, but Jesus is going to explain a, an aspect of the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of heaven, and he's going to explain it using imagery that these, many of these men who were fishermen would have understood. All right, let's look at verse 47 through 52. Here we go. We're going to read it, and then we'll jump in, back into that line. Verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven... Is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered every uh, uh, gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's stop there for now. Number one, the trope of the net. So this trope is, again, language that's used in figurative form, non-literal sense. It's a parable. We've talked about that. It's a parable, okay? So in this day and age, and really now still, it's, it's still kind of the main thing. There, there are people in Mississippi who fish in different ways. You know, they'll just throw dynamite into the water. But other than that, <laughs> there are three main ways of fishing. There are three main ways of fishing. The main way that most of us, when we say, hey, Mike, let's go fishing, what we think is a the hook and line, right? Maybe it's on a pole, maybe whatever, but you're fishing for one fish at a time, okay? When you fish for one fish at a time, generally you are not trying to feed the family or the village with those fish, right? You're maybe trying to feed you, or maybe you're just having fun. But one way people fish is with hook and line, right? Catching one fish at a time, unless you have a different kind of rig on where maybe you could catch two or three, right? But essentially, small numbers. The second way people fish is how a lot of times people would fish with a, with a net, but is a one-person net. Have you seen these people do this and they're catching bait fish or different things? They have this net and there's a special way you hold it. It's over this arm and you're back here and you cast it out and it goes in this almost like beautiful, perfect circle. I can't do it, but some people can. And it, there's weights on the end and it falls down and then you pull it up and there, Lord willing, we'll be fishing there, okay? The third way of fishing is what is described here in this parable. Okay, some of, some of you, if you're maybe from like deep south Georgia or from east Tennessee like me, this is, you might have known this as sane fishing. You're saning. It's not legal, okay, uh, at, at least in, in the way a lot of times people do it. So, but what these guys would do is they would use boats. And basically what you do is you stretch a very large net out between two, sometimes even more than two boats, and it's a drag net. It goes all the way to the bottom, the top of the net to the top, and you rake them in, literally, and you just you catch everything that's between you and where the beach or the, the shore, wherever you're going, right? Um, as a middle schooler, one of my redneck adventures in East Tennessee, in Athens, Tennessee area, we were in a creek, Rogers Creek, right outside the school that I went to that was, FYI, kindergarten through eighth grade, 
Rogers Creek Elementary. That's where I went primarily to middle school. In kindergarten through eighth grade, there were about 300 kids the whole school. Teeny tiny. Uh, it was called Athens, Tennessee. There, it, it wasn't a town. It was just out in the country somewhere. There were cow fields, and oh, look, there's a school. And that one country store, you know, like how the country store is in the middle of nowhere. It was a neat place to grow up, riding four-wheelers and doing stuff, but it was not heavily populated. Let me say it that way. Cows outnumbered people in this area, okay? Uh, but we, my, uh, my step-cousins and I, my stepdad was one of about 13 kids. Uh, one of his brothers had passed away, but all this family literally lived next door to each other, except for maybe one in multi-acre lots on this county, County Road 100 in Athens, Tennessee, right? Uh, Peggy knows a little bit about what this is. She went to Tennessee Wesleyan, which is in Athens. It's actually in the city of Athens, right? We went, that, was a, that wasn't the city, it's town. You went to town. You know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all do, some of you don't. Either way, all right? So, in Rogers Creek, as a middle schooler, my step-cousins with a couple of our, uh, their dads, my step-uncles, we get out, and we've got this same net, and we're in the middle of doing this, and someone mentions, hey, I uh, hope a cop doesn't come by, because this isn't legal, and we're beside the road. This is not smart, okay? This is not smart, but essentially what you would do is you would kind of wade up the, the, the creek with this thing, and at some point, you would kind of turn it to the side, and then you just pull everything up on, on the beach, on the bank, right? It wasn't a beach up on the bank, and you catch everything, some of the fish, it was neat what you'd see, like you'd catch little brim, we caught some big bass, a few catfish, but then there were carp, there were drum, there were, one time we caught a gar, that was not fun trying to get out of the net, right, this alligator gar, that wasn't fun, um, but you catch kind of what you catch, so the point here is, look at verse 47, it says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net, that drag net, that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. Okay, so we have this picture and what Jesus is saying here at the end of the age, there's going to be a time where every fish is caught. Now currently, just FYI, there, there's, there's a net already. But it's not a net that's happening all at once. And essentially, this net is death. Everyone gets netted. And in this imagery, in this picture here, at the end of the age, everyone who's still physically living, everyone gets netted. No one's escaping this. There's a day coming where that's the end, and that's it. That's the only, that's, you're done. Whatever decisions you made, they're made. Whatever choices you've made, they're made. Whatever actions you did... Well, however you live, it's done. It's over in this life. And so we have this picture of this net, and it catches every single kind of fish. Now later what we find out is there's good fish and there's bad fish, but there are multiple kinds of good fish, and just like there are multiple kinds of bad fish. Another redneck story. I remember as a senior in high school, I had a friend who had a really nice bass boat, but one of his favorite things to do during the springtime, you could go bow fishing. Have you ever heard of bow fishing? Okay, literally, you take a bow and arrow. On the back of the arrow, there's some kind of cord, rope, string, and you don't shoot game fish. It's illegal to shoot game fish, but you can shoot gar, you can shoot carp, you can shoot uh, drum, you can shoot non-game fish. Just technically, my dad would call them trash fish. You're allowed to do this. You shoot, you reel them in, I don't know what you did with them, but, but this was, I, I went one time, I can't hit, I couldn't hit that wall with a bow and arrow, okay? I am Robin Hood, I am not, okay? I'm terrible, I'm a terrible shot with a bow, terrible shot, okay? My friend was not, he was like Hawkeye on the front of this thing, it was, it was amazing, he was hitting everything, I literally, I missed the water a few times, okay? Like, but let me tell you, so we do this in a slough. It, you do it while they're spawning and all this stuff. It's like they're excited about what's happening and you just end their life. I don't know that it's right. I don't know that it's good, but this is what's happened, right? Let me tell you the, where the slough was located. The slough was located next to the seventh green on the nicest golf course in the entire area. So here are these guys up there, and they're putting, trying to make par, and we're like, get him! Ah, right, these rednecks down to the slough, right? 
I feel like maybe I'm telling you more than I should. (laughs) The point here is that this net is going to catch not just every fish, it's every kind of fish. Just, just so you know, if you didn't realize this, we live in an area that historically is pretty, has a pretty solid racist past. Praise God that it's not as much like it, at least now, as it was at one point in, in, in the history of this area. But if, if you are someone who, that, if that's a challenge for you, that's a struggle racially for you, can I just tell you, get over it. If you don't like that, you're not going to like heaven. Hello? If you don't like that, you're not going to like heaven. Because the word of God says in Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. These are Christians. These are followers of Jesus. Clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, And crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So let me tell you, if you want to start getting ready for heaven, start letting that go. Amen? Amen. All right. So the net will be full, and there is no escaping this net. But what's interesting here in both of these parables. The angels are the ones coming and doing the separating. Look at what it says here. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. Let's go back up in verses 40 through 43. Just as the weeds, this is the parable of the weeds. Somebody call, sometimes it's called the wheat and the tares. You guys remember that from a few weeks ago, I'm sure. Just as the weeds are gathered and burnt, with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. All right, so we see what the trope of the net is, kind of what the pieces are, what it means. Here's the tenet of the net. This is the tenet is basically the principle, the principle of the net, the tenet. Here, here we go. Ready? Here's the principle. All men will be judged. All people, not just men, like Father's Day. That's not, that's not, the, that's not the message next week. All people will endure judgment, will experience judgment. There are two judgments. There's a judgment for believers, it's called the Bema Seat, and we are judged, and what, we, what happens is we either suffer loss from rewards we could have had, or we, are, we receive rewards because of faithful activity as a follower of Christ. So for believers, there's not a judgment, do you get in or do you not get in? It's how good is heaven for you? How good is eternity for you? Okay? There's a second judgment. It happens later. Exactly how much later people want to debate. But the second judgment is for the lost. It's the great white throne judgment. And this judgment is not the judgment of how good will heaven be for you. In part, this judgment is how bad will hell be for you? Because if you experience that judgment as receiving judgment at that one, heaven is not your home. You don't get the option. You you had your option, and you chose to, to turn from Christ and not receive Christ. So that judgment is spoken of in Revelation 20. Hebrews 9 says it like this. And, as it, uh, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, speaks about this judgment. Follow along with me. Here we go. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, then another book was opened, which, w- which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown 
in the lake of fire. So, the tenet of the net is there's, gonna, there's judgment, there's good, there's bad. Here's the good. Those who have trusted Christ, those are the good fish. Regardless of if it's in this illustration, a bass, a catfish, whatever kind of fish it is. If it's a good fish, that represents those who have trusted Christ. The bad fish are the ones who never received Christ, never submitted to him or trusted in him and received salvation. Got it? Number three. Here's the tragedy of the net, and we're, we're getting into it. The tragedy of the net. Look back at verses 40 through 43 again. Let's, let's read all, all four of those verses. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom with all causes, um, kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then... The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now verse 48 through 50. When it was full, men drew it ashore, talking about the net, and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw, the, threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, let's, let's talk about this. This is not, we don't do a deep dive into a study on hell, and we could definitely do deeper dives than what we're going to have time for today, but we need to understand that hell is a real place. Hell is a real place. According to the Word of God, it wasn't created initially for people. It was created for Satan and his demons. By rejecting the hope of salvation, people choose to go there. In hell, there is God, God is separate from that. And people who live their lives saying, no, I don't want to trust God. I want to be separate from God. God does not force them to spend eternity in heaven with him. So by default, there's only one other option. So let's talk about this for a second. You've got some scripture coming up on the screen. We need to look back, follow along with this as we go. At the end, now, verses 40 through 43 have to do with the parable of the wheat and the tares, the weeds. If you remember... What happened in that parable is, farmer goes out, has his guys sow wheat. In the middle of the night, an enemy comes and sows false wheat into the same field. You can't tell until it gets to a certain point what's what. If you start going out pulling up the false wheat, you can actually injure and mess up the real thing and really mess up your crop. So in this parable, the workers come and say, hey, what do you want us to do? The farmer says, wait till the end of the age, then we'll do the separating We'll burn all the, the bad stuff that's not real wheat, and we'll take care of the good stuff. It's going to make more work for us, but that's the only way we can do it so that we won't harm the real thing, okay? In this parable, we, have, we move from the picture of wheat and weeds to fish and different types of fish, good fish and bad fish, okay? Um, Swedish fish references are coming in my mind right now. I'm not going to go there, okay? So we have good fish and bad fish. So at the end of, the, of every growing season, there is a reaping season. At the end of every growing season, there's a reaping season. We have fruit, crops are picked, they're collected, and every one of these seasons comes to an end. And guess what? We are in a season right now. Your life can be thought of as partly like your season, but we exist inside a season of human history right now. We exist within a season. Jesus says there is going to come an end to this season. Does this season look like what some people think it is, what other people think it is? At the very least, this season is happening now, and it will have an end. We're in the same season that takes place from, from Jesus' resurrection on, basically. From the, when the Spirit of God came, we're in that same season, that same age, that same era. But that time, this time, will come to an end, and maybe we live long enough to see it. But if we don't, our life will come to an end. This season will eventually come to an end. The kingdom of heaven began with the sowing of the word of God. Think back to the parables that we started with in Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven began with the sowing of the word of God in the hearts of men. Much of the seed did not bear fruit, but some was fruitful. Satan opposed the work of God by sowing counterfeits into that same field, encouraging a false growth and by introducing false doctrine. 
And it would seem sometimes because we're in this season, and guess what season we're in? We're in the season where in the same body of water there are good and bad fish. We're in the season, we're in the same body of water, there's wheat and there's tares. And sometimes because of that it looks like the enemy is winning, but you don't need to lose heart because eventually God will make everything right. The first reaping that's uh, mentioned is that of the reaping of the weeds. There are essentially two reapings. Let's reap the weeds, let's reap the wheat. But with the net, it's all, here we go, it's once. The point is, there is a time where everything gets taken care of. Some people would try to say, this false teaching Some people would try to say, well, hell is not a real literal place. It's just idea. It's like eternal death. It's it's like you just cease to exist. Or some people would even say something even like more pervasive and ridiculous. It's like, well, people don't go to hell. There are some people that teach doctrines like, well, you go to purgatory, and if people give enough or pray enough, then you can get out, and then you can go from purgatory to heaven. Purgatory doesn't exist. It's not in the Bible. It's not in there, okay? You have one of two options, and listen, hell is a real place. God sent Jesus so that you and others wouldn't have to go there, but if you reject Christ, that's where eternity will be spent. That's hard, because I don't want anyone I know to go to hell. But at the same time, I mean, do you think, like those who reject Christ and have lived evil like lives in this life, do you, even from a human perspective, do you think, well, I mean, like you, it's okay. Hell is a real place. So let's, let's dig into this very briefly, but hopefully as concisely as possible. Okay? So hell was not created for us. It was created for the enemy. It was created for Satan, his demons, but it is a real place. Uh, so some things about hell. Coming up on the screen, you've got verses to uh, support this. Hell is a place of eternal punishment away from the presence of God. Matthew 25, 46, Jesus said this, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, they will suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Second, hell is a place of eternal fire. Hell is a place of eternal fire. Mark chapter 9, verses 43 and 48. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. Verse 48, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Hell is a place of eternal fire. Next, hell is a place of eternal bondage and darkness. For God did not, this is 2 Peter 2, 4, for God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Next, hell is a place of eternal sadness and suffering. Matthew 8, 12, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is real. So is heaven. Hello? We should be excited about that. Hell is real. But so is heaven. This is from the book of Revelation. This is from chapter 21. Let's read this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life 
without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The tragedy of the net is this. Some, for some, the net is relief. Yes, let's go be with Jesus. But for others, I'm not sure what's happening. But for others, the net is the beginning of eternal judgment. Did you know this? Noah built an ark, and while he built an ark, he built it because God had warned him that rain was coming, and he told Noah, while you're building, preach. Tell people about the judgment that's coming. Anybody remember how many years Noah built the ark for? Anybody remember? Some of y'all, 120 years. He preached and built for 120 years. How many people believed Noah outside of his immediate family? Zero. Imagine what that was like when for the very first time rain fell. You heard it earlier when we were in here just for a moment. You heard a heavy rain just for a second. Imagine rain that's going to cause a literal worldwide flood. And it wasn't just rain. At this time, water came up from the ground, and guess what? The scripture says that the, the land burst open, and not only did water rain, water came up. And it literally worldwide flood, not a localized flood, a worldwide flood. And it wasn't just a 40 day flood, it was just a 40 day rain. How long you, it took a while for the flood waters to recede. Now, think about this for a second. The people who heard for 120 years, at least some portion of that, heard Noah preaching, didn't believe him, laughed at him, mocked him, looks a crazy boat guy, he's in a desert. Right? He thinks, why does he need a boat in the desert? This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Let's look, let's look at this. Imagine when it, think about what it might have been like for those people when it did start to rain. God has already shut the door. Options are, option for them to get on the boat. They're done. Imagine people who have been warned for 120 years all of a sudden going, oh, I should probably listen to that, but it's too late. I imagine when Noah got off the boat, claw marks from people trying to get it open so that they could get in and get rescued. Those people did not die and go to heaven. They had rejected. They rejected. Those people perished in the flood and listen to me. They are in hell today. They're still there. No reprieve, no end in sight. Done. Sealed. They had their option. They had their opportunity. They, had their, they literally had Noah preaching to them. And they said no. This is why the church of the living God. This is much of the reason why the church of the living God must take serious our command to take the gospel to everyone, everywhere. We can't choose for them, but we understand and we know, listen, why, why is the kingdom of God like a treasure hidden in a field, the treasure of all treasures? The reason why it's like the treasure of all treasures like we looked at last week is because without that treasure, we enter into eternity separated from God. That's why it's the treasure of all treasures. Why is it like the pearl of great price? 
Because nothing is more valuable than eternal life given to us because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And listen, we're trading, we, we are spending part of our lives or much of our lives trading the goodness and the salvation of God for a plastic pearl necklace. One old theologian said it's like we're just busy and content making mud pies when eternal delicacies are offered to us. We're content sitting in the mud making pies. Y'all, hell is real. But so is heaven. Don't experience the hell that wasn't designed for you. Experience heaven and eternal life, abundant life now, by placing your faith in Jesus. Because guess what? Hell wasn't created for you, but heaven was. An abundant life here is offered to you. Why would you say no to that? Why would you say no to that? And here's the last point. The treasure of the parables. The treasure of the parables. Here we go. This is going to be super fast. Look at verse 51 and 52. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes, because you told us. <laughs> right? Like, it's an open book test. Yeah, we get it now. Have you understood all these things? Yes. Verse 52, and he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Here's the ending. Ready? We, we technically, it's talked about scribes and like household, like homeowners. There's actually a third kind of uh, uh, character person in there that you might not notice. It says scribes. And then, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom, this is like a disciple. A scribe and then a person trained for the kingdom, that's a disciple. And then it talks about master of a house. So here, here's the point of this. Let, let, me, let me get some, some specifics here. Scribes, what they did, they studied, they learned, they analyzed, they copied, but many of them stopped there. They got information. In our context... You might think of a scribe in some ways, not in every way, but in some ways like the person who grew up in church and they know all the answers. Like they know, they know what the Bible says, they got it, right? They've got knowledge, but that's where it stops. The second person that, that's kind of described here is the disciple. The disciple or apprentice doesn't only learn the word, he lives the word. So this is the scribe who is trained, that he knows it, and then he or she, they live the word. So church family, let's not just be like scribes, let's live as disciples so that we know it and we live it. But then the third one is the household, householder, the homeowner, right? The master of the house. A householder, the master of the house, knows the word, lives the word, but he or she also shares the word. They're the master of the house. What do they do? They, they open the doors. And they say, come in. Come in. But part of Jesus' point here is this. We need to see where we are and, are you ready? Here's the fun, not fun part. He asked them in verse 51, do you understand all this? They're like, yeah, yeah, we got it, we got it. <laughs> kind of like how sometimes we yeah, I understand. And they're like, okay, now what? <laughs> do you understand this? Yeah, yeah, okay. Essentially what Jesus is telling them here now is, okay, now you're accountable. You know it. Now live it. And now share it. Now live it and now share it. We are all now responsible for what we have heard from the Word of God. What will we do with it? What will we do with it? It is good to know the Word of God. It is better to live and to share the Word of God. Right? Two of us agree with that. Awesome. How will we respond? 
we can look at this as like some school lesson. Well, I wonder what they did. Let's go do, let's look at history. Now, what about us? What about us? How will we respond? Non-believers, if you have never trusted Christ, there are two responses. You will make one of them today. If you've never trusted Christ, you'll make one of these two responses today. You will either harden your heart and say, I'll do that later. I'll, let me think. I'll think about it. I'll, I'll. You'll harden your heart and in some way, shape, or form kind of give God the Heisman, stiff arm. Or you will humble yourself before the Lord and by faith receive what Jesus paid for that you would have, eternal life. It's as simple as something like this. God, I've sinned against you, but in faith I turn from my sin and I trust on you, Jesus. Faith. Simple as that. If you've never done that, I want you to hear me. It's not an accident that you're here today. You came even though it rained. You came even though some of you have been busting your tail all week long to get ready for kids' camp. I'm so excited. We, as of a few weeks ago, I think, if I'm remembering right, I think we had more kids registered a few weeks ago than we had at any one day last year. Like our highest attendance of children, I think we have more registered a few weeks ago than the highest day last year. Some of you are like, gulp, like, right? But praise God for that. Well, you, they need Jesus, but you can't give them what you don't have. Trust Christ. If you do know the Lord, believers will respond potentially in a few ways to this. One possible response is endure through difficult times, knowing that in the end, Jesus will make it all right. They might get away for it with it now, but they will not get away with it forever. Unless they trust Jesus, and then they get away with it like we did. Because Jesus paid for it. So number one, endure through difficulty. Number two, trust God's timing and his justice. Again, we might not see it in this life. So for us, we must repent of living angry, frustrated bitter lives as Christians. We've got to repent of that and say, no, God, I trust you. Because they need you just like I needed you. So I trust your timing. I trust your judgment. I trust your justice. You know I don't. And here's the third way, third potential way. Because we know the dragnet is coming before it does come, we, as followers of Jesus, live as fishers of men. Remember, Jesus told his disciples that, right? He said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Until the age ends, until God's net comes and, fill, and is full with every type of fish that exists. Until that time, we should be casting our net throwing out our bait. And can I tell you, the bait we have is not likes. We're grateful for this band, but the bait we have is not this band. The bait you have is not, well, my pastor, he's bald. Come hear him. The bait, the bait you have is the hope that's in Jesus. You've got the good news of the gospel. Jesus said in, Matt, in John 3, if they've rejected me, they're condemned already. They're already condemned. Why don't you go and, and get, show them how they can pass from that condemnation into life. Take the good news of Jesus to people. So our last response, knowing the net is coming, we live as fishers of men. How will you respond today? What will you do today? You've heard You've heard these parables. Many of you have been here every single week through these. How will you respond today? As Jesus has explained to us about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, how will we live as kingdom citizens? Have you entered into his kingdom? Trust him if you've never done it.